Hi, my name is Paul Cahan, and I'm the featured speaker tonight at the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the Wisconsin Club. The topic of my discussion tonight is amiable scoundrel Simon Cameron, Lincoln's scandalous Secretary of War. It's based on my brand new biography, uh, which is available on Amazon.com. And tonight, for the low, low price of $27, you can get your own signed copy. Thank you. Good evening. How are you all tonight? See, this is with a hard part because now I've already eaten my dinner. Now you're going to make me sing for it. You've actually done it in the wrong order. You've got to make me sing for my dinner before you give it to me. Uh, I want to thank the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable for bringing me out. And I want to thank Jonathan for driving me up today. I definitely would have gotten lost uh, had it not been for him, so I certainly appreciate that. Uh, you know, I love speaking to Civil War roundtables because the accumulated knowledge in this room is astonishing. You know, I'm reminded of, um, you know, just the amount of knowledge there is about the Civil War and how you can look at one set of documents and come to one set of conclusions, look at a totally different set of documents, come to a completely different set of conclusions. And in many ways, my discussion tonight is going to be based on nuancing what we think we know about Simon Cameron. And actually, my, my thunder was stolen a little bit because you referenced that infamous uh, story about wouldn't steal a red hot stone. And of course, you've all heard that story, right? You know, uh, Thaddeus Stevens. How, did, who got the Thaddeus Stevens book? You made out like a bandit. That is a good book. Thaddeus Stevens, uh, congressman from Pennsylvania, is meeting with Abraham Lincoln shortly after uh, Lincoln takes uh, office. And Lincoln says, well, what do you think about Simon Cameron as Secretary of War? Of course, Thaddeus Stevens and, and Cameron are both from the state of Pennsylvania. And you know, Stevens says, well, you know, I don't think he would steal a red hot stove. And this, of course, delights Lincoln, who loves a good joke. So the next time the cabinet meets, Lincoln shares this with the cabinet. And of course, you know, Cameron is aghast at this. And he you know, runs into Thaddeus Stevens on the street and says, I can't believe you would say that. What are you doing? You, I demand a retraction. So a few weeks later, Stevens is meeting with the president. And he says, oh, by the way, the last time we spoke, I believe I said uh, Cameron wouldn't steal a red hot stove. I take that back. You know, normally that's a laugh line. People actually laugh at that. Oh, there we go. What I need is a sign that says applause. I think that this is going to be a tough crowd. Um, Hopefully the Chicago crowd will be a little bit easier on me. Um, but in any way, you know, that's as far as we know all we need to know about Simon Cameron. He wouldn't steal a red hot stove. Or maybe he would. Right? And this is the story that comes down to us. How many of you have read Doris Kearns Goodwin's magisterial team of rivals? Big, thick, prize-winning, amazing book, right? I mean, that is a great book. And if you read that book, what you come away with is Simon Cameron was a thief. End of story. Now let's move on. And you know, I was reading that book um, in 2012, and I was like, God, you know, there isn't a whole lot on this guy, Simon Cameron. I'd like to know more. Because I knew that I wanted to write a book on the Civil War in Pennsylvania. And so I was casting about for subjects. And so I, you know, I read Team of Rivals. I was like, God, is this all there is about Simon Cameron? So I went looking for more information. And there are, as a matter of fact, exactly one and one half biographies of Simon Cameron. The complete biography was published in the 1960s by Edwin S. Bradley, noted historian of, pen, of uh, 19th century Pennsylvania politics. And it's a cradle to grave biography of Cameron. It's, you know, pretty fluffy, but, you know, for the era in which it was written, it's okay. The previous biography was written in 1942, and it was clearly supposed to be part of a two volume set. And I don't know if the author, you know, uh, just got bored or dropped dead of embarrassment or what quite happened, but he never got around to writing the second biography. So it only takes the story up to 1860. It doesn't deal with Cameron as Secretary of War, it doesn't deal with Cameron's career afterwards. 
And so I was sitting at the dinner table one night complaining about, you know, this shortage of information. And I guess my wife had heard this complaint one too many times, and she said, well, if you don't like any of the books, you should write a better one. And she has come to regret having said that, because that is exactly what I did. And 14 months later, I came out of my office, beard all, uh, you know, grown, fingernails a mile long, but I had the first draft of Amiable Scoundrel, which is the book that not for nothing is for sale tonight. And incidentally, Jonathan committed you all to buying every single copy. So I don't know what you gotta do, but it's $27 and there are 13 more copies and you all gotta buy them because we're not leaving with them. And you know, so Simon Cameron's story, you know, really kind of fascinated me in large part because there was no, you know, real information about it. And the central question that presents itself about Simon Cameron is this. Simon Cameron is the wiliest politician of his generation. He manages to elbow his way into Lincoln's cabinet, right? Through sharp dealing, through shrewd political maneuvers. And then he gets to the War Department like his brain falls out. You know, his IQ drops 100 points. He becomes a total feckless schmuck. It's just a total train wreck. It's a total dumpster fire. And Lincoln ends up firing him. And thank God Edwin Stanton comes along. I mean, that's the story we hear, right? But think about that for a second. Does that actually make sense? Does it actually make sense that this incredibly wily politician who builds a political machine in one of the most important states electorally, locks it up better than anyone else of his generation, gets to the War Department and just, you know, just becomes a total boob? I mean, when you think about it logically, that doesn't make sense. And so that was my entree point to Simon Cameron. I wanted to figure out what happened. How do we go from a guy who is undeniably talented, undeniably brilliant, political uh, um, stra strategist of unparalleled skill to being a total boob when it comes to working in the War Department? So that's the research question that frames Amiable Scoundrel. And what I discovered about Simon Cameron is Simon Cameron's life is a particularly good laboratory for understanding American politics in the 19th century. Cameron is born in 1799, the last year of George Washington's life. He dies in 1889 during Grover Cleveland's presidency. So imagine that bookend. Yeah, wow, exactly, right? Imagine the bookend of American political history that he lives through. He comes of age during the Jacksonian era, right? And what I would argue to you is more than anyone else, you know, we talk about the age of Jackson, but we should actually talk about the age of Simon Cameron. Now, you're, you're giggling. I hope in about half an hour I will have convinced you that rather than talking about the age of Andrew Jackson, we should be talking about the age of Simon Cameron. Cameron's story highlights four key facets about American political history from roughly the 1820s through about the late 1870s. The first factor is the key is the relationship between state power and national prestige. Now when we write political histories of the Civil War, we tend to tell the story from the top down. We tend to look at what's going on in the White House. We tend to look at what's going on in the Congress, right? I mean, we tend to look at what's going on in Washington. And what we forget is how these guys got to Washington, particularly people in the Senate or people in the White House. And the answer is, more often than not, the political leaders on the national level get to their positions by controlling the political uh, environments of their states. Uh, when we think of guys like Martin Van Buren, when we think of guys like James Buchanan, that's how these guys ascend to high national political office. Same with Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun. They build political machines in their states. And this is particularly true of people who serve in the Senate, because, of course, remember how senators are selected in this period. We don't elect them directly. They are chosen by the legislatures of their states with the implicit understanding that they will represent the interests of the state, not necessarily the interests of the voters. And so what I would argue is that by focusing too narrowly on the national story, we miss the connection between what's going on in the states and what goes on in Washington. 
And time and time again, Cameron's story reminds us that local and state politics is incredibly important to shaping politicians' actions and viewpoints on seemingly national questions. And when we get uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cameron jumping from the Democratic Party to the Know Nothing Party to the Republican Party and the reasons for that. So state power is incredibly important. And in Cameron's, play, in Cameron's case, understanding the unique role of Pennsylvania is incredibly important. Pennsylvania throughout the 19th century has the second highest number of electoral votes in the Union. Now, all, everybody in this room knows that Pennsylvania elects only a single president, and that is, why the greatest president ever? Buchanan. Buchanan. I think he's like number three in the pantheon of great presidents, right? I say that because... Yeah, he was a doe face. And that's actually the title of the biography that I'm not working on, because my wife said she would divorce me if I wrote another book. So I'm not writing a biography of, Simon, of James Buchanan called Doe Face, James Buchanan, America's Worst President. I want to be clear that I am not writing that book. It'll be out in 2019. Um, Pennsylvania, you know, Pennsylvania gets slammed. Well, we only have one president from, from Pennsylvania. That's absolutely true. Pennsylvania is rarely the king in this period, but it is always the king maker. You cannot win the White House unless you lock up Pennsylvania. And so when it comes to locking up Pennsylvania, you got to lock up Simon Cameron, particularly from 1860 forward. In fact, James Buchanan's disastrous presidency does more than anything else to make Cameron the undisputed political boss of the state of Pennsylvania. And so throughout the rest of his career, for the next quarter century, he is going to be the go-to guy for getting things done in the Keystone State and for getting Republicans elected. So Pennsylvania is a crucial state. And state politics are incredibly important to understand what goes on in Washington. That's the first. The second factor of 19th century politics is the importance of the media, particularly media organs. I was born in 1980. Consider the change, the technological changes that I've seen in my lifetime. Imagine you are my parents going to the hospital. I was born in February of 1980. And there you are, my mother's in labor, my father wants to get the news. Does he open up his laptop and go to Twitter? Does he go to his favorite blog? Does he check the news stories in the right-hand column on Facebook? No, absolutely not. He turns on ABC, NBC, or CBS. And maybe if he's got a few extra bucks in his pocket, they're subscribing to this new thing called CNN, right? There's a relatively small number of media outlets. And those media outlets are pitching to the largest audience possible. So ABC is trying to get as many conservatives and as many uh, liberals to watch the news as possible. It's a very mid-grade news, right? Now let's flash forward 36 years. Tonight, any one of you could go home and start the next million person following YouTube feed. You could start the next blog that reaches thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. You could get an email list that would allow you to distribute whatever newsletter you wanted to write um, to hundreds of thousands or millions of people, all for very little cost. I mean, think about writing a newsletter in 1980. You didn't have a photocopy machine in your basement. You couldn't scan it. You probably had to take it and get it printed at a commercial printer and then mailed out. Think about the costs versus the costs of doing it today. We have lived through a technological revolution over the last 40 years that has narrowed the barriers of entry. It's made it cheaper and faster and easier to reach thousands and even millions of people very, very efficiently. Is that true? We'd all agree with that? Simon Cameron lives through a very similar technological revolution. In the 1820s and 1830s, there are a number of key technological changes that reshape the media landscape. We have the introduction of steam-powered printing presses. 
we have the introduction of wood pulp press, of wood pulp paper, which drops the cost of printing newspapers. As a result, we see an explosion of newspapers. And now they're filled with news that's carried on railroads, carried on canals, and transmitted by telegraphs. It's now possible for a newspaper to report, a newspaper in Philadelphia to report on events that took place in California 24 hours earlier. The country has literally gotten smaller by the time Cameron reaches my age. It's possible for him to eat his breakfast in Harrisburg, get on a train, eat his lunch in Philadelphia, and be back in Harrisburg for dinner by the time that he's my age, something that would have been impossible on the day that he was born. <laughs> Those technological revolutions reshape the media landscape. And just as today, the media has become more partisan, it's become more factionalized, it's pitching to a much smaller audience. You have this efflorescence of media outlets in the form of newspapers that are pitching to ever smaller audiences. Pro-tariff Democrats in northern states, abolitionist Whigs with southern sympathies, and I'm just making things up. There is a newspaper that prints for those groups of people. And those newspapers are, you know, consciously trying to pitch to those audiences. Well, how do those newspapers survive? They survive, they actually survive through the spoil system, which is the third key element of this period. The spoil system, named by us, New York Senator William L. Marcy, who argues that, you know, to the victor go the spoils. The idea that uh, politicians win elections in order to reward their followers through the distribution of patronage, government jobs, government contracts, etc. And this becomes really the fuel that makes politics work in this era. Now, we've talked about the media and spoils. Let's re-inject Cameron into this discussion. Cameron gets his start as an apprentice in a newspaper office in Harrisburg. From there, he takes over a newspaper in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, before moving to Washington, D.C., where he uh, works for, um, not the Congressional Globe, the predecessor of the Congressional Globe, and then eventually he moves back to Harrisburg, where he cr takes over a newspaper there. That becomes the basis of his wealth. But the reality of the situation is what makes him a wealthy man as a newspaper person is the fact that he receives patronage from influential Pennsylvanians, like Governor Andrew Schultz, who Cameron promotes as a, as a uh, political candidate and ultimately propels into the governorship. So this new media environment creates all kinds of opportunities for building political careers and creating great wealth with the idea that once the person you propel into political office achieves that office, they will reward you with all kinds of contracts. And in fact, Cameron and his brothers are incredible recipients of Pennsylvania state patronage. Cameron and his brothers get uh, printing contracts, they get uh, contracts to build various parts of the Pennsylvania Canal. Cameron is named Adjutant General of the State Militia. It's from this brief period as Adjutant General that he takes the lifelong term General. And in fact, after he leaves the War Department, he ends up uh, getting a General's frock coat created for when he goes to Russia. So he actually rolls into the Tsar's office in a General's frock coat, if you can imagine that. Because of course, he calls himself General Cameron throughout the rest of his life. So these three key elements, the relationship between state power and national prestige, the new media environment, and the spoil system all form the basis of this political environment. Now, of course, the last element is probably the most important, and that's the endemic factionalism of political parties in this period. My guess would be that if we divided you up among Democrats and Republicans in this room, two things would be true. The first is most of you are the same political party you were when you first registered to vote. Or if you've changed political parties, it's only changed once. Would you agree with that statement? Democrats tend to be Democrats for the rest of their lives, Republicans tend to be Republicans for the rest of their lives, yeah? I would also argue, we divide the Republicans up, we divide the Democrats up, and I hand you a list of issues. Most of the Democrats 
are going to agree on most positions about most of those issues most of the time. And the same thing for the Republicans. Would you agree with that? You tend to be Republicans because there's a political party platform that you agree with. You tend to be Democrats because there's a political party platform that you agree with. And sometimes the party runs a candidate that you don't particularly like, but you vote for them because they're better than the other guy. Right? I say that in one of the most, in the shadow of one of the most fracturous elections of my lifetime, and a lot of people voting for the candidate of their party, even though they didn't like those individuals. Right? Okay, that's good. So, you know, you're bound together by a shared platform and a shared set of ideas. Well, political parties in the 19th century are not like that. They're loose coalitions of people that have very little in common. Martin Van Buren describes the Democratic Party as this bizarre mashup of you know, the urban working class and southern slave-owning elites. These people have very little in common, except that they hate the same people. And not for nothing, shared hatreds are really the things that tend to bind these parties together. The Whigs who rise up to oppose the Democrats have even less in common. I mean, this is a party that's big enough for John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay. Two people who could agree on only one thing. They hated Andrew Jackson. And if you were a Whig, if you got two Whigs in a room, I guarantee you they would agree on almost nothing except they hated Andrew Jackson. And when you think about it, that's a very weak basis for political parties. How do you motivate these people to show up at the polls? Particularly after, you know, Andrew Jackson dies. What do you say to these people? How do you get them to show up to the polls? And the answer is through the, di through the judicious distribution of patronage, through the creation of media organs that are designed to boost the candidacy of preferred candidates, and through the promise of additional political rewards to get them to show up. But these political parties are in incredible tension during this period. In fact, right now I'm just finishing up a manuscript, a narrative history of Grant's presidency. And in many ways, the Repu Grant's presidency is the crucible that turns the Republican Party into a legitimate party. The Republicans face a crisis of identity after the war. Because what binds the Republicans together is they all fall somewhere on this spectrum of anti-slavery, right? Some who are like, well, I'm a conservative on this issue. I don't think the government really has the power to do anything about it, but I don't like it. And outright abolitionists. And then the war comes. And the war ends slavery. And so the Republicans are like, well, now what do we believe? Are we even a party? We've achieved our great end. And as a result, you know, they go out and they find a guy to run in 1868 who doesn't really seem to have any political beliefs. And they can all sort of rally around. When we get to 1872, it's a totally different discussion. Grant actually ends up, you know, you know they, they end up purging the party, essentially, and pushing out the liberal Republicans. And the Democrats don't even really run a candidate in 1872. You have two Republican candidates running. But to get that story, you'll have to read my other book. Let's talk about Simon Cameron tonight. So Cameron you know, comes of age just as the political rules are shifting. Cameron reach, you know, reaches his mid-20s just as the Jackson machine is really coming into its own. And he, more than anyone else, masters the rules of this new political environment. He pulls himself up by his bootstraps, essentially by being the ultimate political fixer. He is James Carville of the 19th century. And in fact, it's not until he reaches middle age that he runs for political office in his own right. Throughout his 20s and 30s and 40s, his claim to political fame is he attaches himself to upwardly mobile politicians and boosts their career. Governor Andrew Schulz, Andrew Jackson, and also a little known Pennsylvanian named James Buchanan. Buchanan owes his election to the Senate in the 1830s largely to Cameron's efforts. And it's only after Buchanan leaves the Senate to become Polk's Secretary of State that Cameron says, okay, now it's my time to shine. 
and he goes into the Senate, and even though he's a Democrat, and Polk's a Democrat, he finds himself at loggerheads with the Polk administration. More often than not, he disagrees with the president. And he ends up defeating a number of, of Polk's nominations. And in fact, Polk's presidency is the perfect illustration of these four elements. Polk gets elected largely by locking up the political control of Tennessee. And he does this by allying himself with Andrew Jackson's supporters in Tennessee. He ends up being president, and the first thing he does, even before he takes the oath of office, is he lays the groundwork for, for taking over the main Democratic newspaper in Washington, D.C. Because he wants a mouthpiece that's loyal not to Jackson, but to him. Even though he's Jackson's protege, he wants the paper to be loyal to him. And you know who he gets to buy out the original editors of the newspaper and install new editors to finance the newspaper in its first year? Simon Cameron, newspaper man, political fixer extraordinaire. He brings the various factions of the Democratic Party into his cabinet. Buchanan is a very important mover and shaker in the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania. He's got to bring Buchanan into his administration. But do you remember who Polk's vice president was? This is probably an unfair question. Do you know what state Polk's vice president was from? Pennsylvania, George Mifflin Dallas. Dallas was the head of another faction of the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania. Polk brings them both into his cabinet as a way of solidifying his relationship with both parties. And they all live happily ever after. It goes totally fine, and it's not like the Secretary of State and the Vice President are at each other's throats. And then you throw Cameron into the mix, who's got his own agenda, and what you've got is three prominent Democrats from the state of Pennsylvania each vying for control of patronage. And that's largely what these squabbles are about. And throughout Polk's presidency, Buchanan finds it in his interests to ally with Cameron against the president and against the vice president. But shortly after Polk leaves office, Cameron and Buchanan's uh, working relationship begins breaking down. And in large part, Cameron flees the Democratic Party by the time we get to the mid-1850s. He jumps first to the know-nothings and then eventually to the Republican Party. And this becomes proof to most historians. You see, this Simon Cameron, he's slippery and he has no convictions whatsoever. And I would argue that that's flat out wrong. Cameron does have political convictions. Cameron sees himself first last and always as a Pennsylvanian. In fact, he says, I'm a Pennsylvanian first and a Democrat second. And in the 1830s and 1840s, when there's room in the Democratic Party for protecting Pennsylvania's interests by, through the tariff and through subsidies to industry, Cameron can fit in the Democratic Party. One of the things that Polk's presidency does is essentially purge high tariff Democrats. It pushes them out. And so as a result, you have to make a choice. Am I a Pennsylvanian or a Democrat? Buchanan, incidentally, decides I'm a Democrat. Cameron decides I'm a Pennsylvanian. And that's the reason Buchanan becomes president and Cameron never does. But ultimately, Cameron so goes looking for another political party to defend Pennsylvania's interests. And so he settles first with the know-nothings. Now, you've all heard of the know-nothings, right? This anti-immigrant, anti-Irish, anti-Catholic party, right? Those dirtbags. You've heard of them. And you know, look, absolutely. The know-nothings are a bunch of anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Irish dirtbags. But we also have to look at what else they were. And there was a strong anti slavery sentiment. And in fact, the Pennsylvania know nothing send Cameron a questionnaire about his political beliefs. It's got like 10 or 12 questions. Eight of them have to do with the tariff. Three of them have to do with slavery. One has to do with immigration. And Cameron gives some half-assed answer like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, immigration's a problem. We got to do something about that. But let's talk about the tariff. And that in many ways is Cameron's signature issue. When the Know Nothing Party cracks up over the issue of slavery, Cameron ends up fleeing to the nascent Republican Party and quickly establishes himself as a leader in the party 
in a crucial state. In fact, the state legislature of Pennsylvania names a county after Cameron in 1860. And this is an honor that James Buchanan doesn't get, right? The president of the United States doesn't get a county named after him. Simon Cameron does, which gives you a sense of just how important Cameron was in, this, in Pennsylvania in 1860. And he takes that power with him to Chicago and uses it to broker an agreement in Chicago with Lincoln's men. I will deliver you Pennsylvania's uh, votes in exchange for a place in the cabinet. And that ultimately is the agreement. And Cameron not only does his part, he not only delivers the delegates' votes to Lincoln, making Lincoln the, the nominee, he also delivers Pennsylvania's votes to Lincoln in 1860, making Lincoln president of the United States. Now Lincoln tries to weasel out of his commitment. Uh, in large part because uh, Cameron's political enemies argue that he's corrupt and, oh my God, you can't take him into the cabinet. Cameron very deftly counters their criticisms and builds political momentum to ensure that Lincoln cannot refuse him a seat in the Senate. Or, excuse me, refuse him a seat in the cabinet. Which brings us to the central question. Everything I've just laid out is what a brilliant political strategist Cameron is. What a just genius politically he was. And then he gets to the War Department and he's just a total mess. Everything you think you know about Cameron in that regard is wrong. And I'm not saying Cameron was a great administrator. He wasn't. Cameron was a mediocre administrator. But there are two things Cameron was not. A total failure and corrupt at least insofar as the administration of the War Department goes. Now, one of the things that I need to suggest to you is that we have, we live in a post-civil service reform era. How many of you had civil service jobs or have ever applied for civil service jobs? Okay, you know how it goes, right? You go down there, you take a test, you give them their resume, about six months later they send you your results, you're put on a list, they have to interview a set number of people, right? They bring you in, you're one of three or five, they interview you, and they ask you a whole bunch of questions. But what is the one question they don't ask you? Party affiliation, exactly right. Civil service reform is all about hiring the most qualified person regardless of their political affiliation. That is the exact opposite of the spoil system. The whole idea was to hire people because of their political affiliation, right? <coughs> So there is a certain level where this is a foreign universe to us. That should strike us all as hideously corrupt. And what I'm asking you to do is I want you to put aside your judgment about that for a second and just accept that that's the way business was done. And so the way that I want to frame this is if that's the bar, is Cameron above that bar, corrupt for his day, or below that bar, not corrupt for his day? even if it strikes us as hideously corrupt based on our baseline. Does that make sense? And what I will argue is Cameron was not corrupt for his day. Cameron was not the spoilsman at the War Department that Seward was at the State Department or the Chase was at uh, the Treasury Department. In fact, Cameron goes out of his way to appoint fewer Pennsylvanians than he might otherwise be entitled to because he knew that with this massive expansion of the government bureaucracy, everybody was looking at him, including his political enemies. And he said, if I give them any fodder, it will distract from the war effort. I'm going to appoint fewer Pennsylvanians. Now, that doesn't mean that Cameron was totally an angel. He wasn't. He was a human being. And this was the rules of the political game that he was playing. My point is his reputation for corruption is wildly overblown. And I go into great length in the book, it's fantastic by it, um, explaining all of this. But one of the things that people typically say is they say, well, you know, Cameron must have been corrupt because he got fired. He absolutely got fired. Lincoln absolutely fired him in the most unceremonious, un-Lincoln way imaginable. I mean, you watch that Steven Spielberg movie, and Lincoln is like a human doormat. He's got patience and caring. Right, he's like, he's like my daughter's stuffed animal. He's just 100% love. You just want to reach out and just hug his big six foot bony, you know, self because he's just like a big bundle of joy. Cameron, if, if you knew nothing about Lincoln but what you read in Amiable Scoundrel, you would think this guy was the biggest jerk in the world because he was uncharacteristically obnoxious and nasty to Cameron. 
That story that we tell about Thaddeus Stevens is hilarious, don't get me wrong. But it also shows that Lincoln had a real, you know, he had a real thing about Cameron. We see it in his attempt to, with, to renege on his promise to take Cameron into his, uh, uh, into his cabinet. We also see it in the way that he fires Cameron. And you can read all about it in the book. But what I want to suggest to you is the reason Cameron gets fired is not because he's corrupt. It's because he advocates the enlistment of African Americans. From the moment that the war starts, you get the fleeing of blacks into Union lines. And the Union army says, what do you want us to do with these people? Like, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to return them? Can we put them to work? Can we put them in uniform? And the Lincoln administration keeps kicking this can down the road. It keeps trying to avoid making a policy. But as I would argue, not making a policy is making a policy. And Cameron says repeatedly throughout the spring and summer of 1861, let's arm African Americans. Because this is going to be a long war, and we need to bring as much manpower and resources as possible to bear on the Southerners. The only way we're going to win is to make this a total war and to destroy the South. And what better way to do that than deprive them of their labor force and put that labor force into battle against them. Lincoln doesn't want to do this. And Lincoln doesn't want to do this because of the border states. He's convinced that if this becomes a war against slavery, the four border states will secede, and then he's facing four more states uh, you know, in this mounting crisis. So by the time we get to the summer of 1861, particularly after the Battle of Bull Run, Cameron is making this argument more aggressively in the cabinet, and it's obvious he's not getting where. So as we move into the autumn of 1861, he begins showing up at public speeches where people are making this argument. Now Cameron doesn't make this argument publicly, but you can imagine he's, you know, you have this speaker at the rostrum, we should arm African Americans. And Cameron's standing right here. He doesn't say anything, but the implication is clear. We should arm African Americans. And the goal seems to have been to put pressure on the Lincoln administration. Lincoln just totally ignores this. And so in December of 1861, Cameron takes the fateful step. Every, all of the cabinet departments have to issue annual reports to the president that he will then use to write his annual report to Congress. Cameron argues in his annual report to the president that the War Department should allow the enlistment of African Americans. And he mails it out to the newspapers before giving it to the president in an attempt to force the president's hand. When the president reads the report two days after Cameron has mailed it out, you can just imagine his head explodes. And he orders the postmaster general to try and get as many copies back as possible. Well, of course, that doesn't happen. And the report ends up being reported in the newspapers. And now, not only is the story Simon Cameron argues that we should arm African Americans, it becomes a scandal because it says the president tried to cover this up. And from that moment until Cameron leaves the cabinet a month later, he is totally sidelined in war negotiations. He is basically sidelined by the administration. And his time in the cabinet is clearly limited. And he's forced out the following month. Now the problem with Simon Cameron is, again, he is an incredibly important force in an incredibly important state politically. You can't just fire him. So Lincoln says, well, I'm going to gratify your wish to leave the cabinet and go to Russia. Because, you know, everybody just wants to go to Russia. In reality, Russia ha has been throughout the 19th century that place where you send troublesome Pennsylvanians. Jackson sent Buchanan to there. When Buchanan becomes president, he sends George Mifflin Dallas there. Cameron and Lincoln says, ah, Russia, that's where we send troublesome Pennsylvanians. And so Cameron goes uh, to Russia, and he stays there for less than a year. He toys with running in 1863 for the Senate. He decides ultimately not to. But he comes back in 1864 and some of the, or excuse me, in 1863, and some of the president's political opponents come to him and say, hey, why don't we run another candidate for the presidency? Why don't we pick another Republican? Cameron says, that's insane. I have my own issues with Lincoln, but it's insane. We've got to stick with this guy. And he says, and not only do we have to stick with this guy, Lincoln's got to win. Because if he doesn't win um, the election, the war is over. And so ultimately, these two guys need each other. Lincoln needs Cameron to deliver Pennsylvania. Because remember, who is Lincoln facing in the 1864 election? McClellan. And where is McClellan from? Philadelphia is, is, is where? It might be Pennsylvania. McClellan 
is a home state boy, and yet Pennsylvania votes to reelect the president. And it does so largely through the influence of Simon Cameron. And that's the moment where Simon Cameron's political rehabilitation begins. Lincoln needs Cameron in order to win Pennsylvania. Cameron needs Lincoln to sort of smooth his reentry into politics. By 1867, Cameron has been returned to the Senate. He begins his longest term in the Senate, 10 years, between 1867 and 1877. He becomes a particular favorite of Ulysses S. Grant ends up as chairman of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and ultimately resigns in 1877 when it becomes clear that the era of uh, uh, politics that he had come of age in is rapidly changing. We begin to see in the late 1870s greater pressure to end the spoil system and to enact civil service reform. And so Cameron can see the political winds shifting. And he recognizes that all of the things that made it possible for him to achieve wealth and political influence are rapidly changing. And so he ends up retiring from the Senate in 1877. That is not, however, the end of his influence. He lives for another 12 years. He retires to his country estate in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where he is visited by presidents of both parties, by governors of Pennsylvania. He entertains senators and congresspeople and you know, uh, international uh, people of repute. Um, and he continues to take an active role in the political machine that he built in the Keystone State, which lasts until 1935. Pennsylvania is controlled by Cameron's Republican political machine until FDR. Think about that for a second. That is a political achievement that Seward, that Chase, that Lincoln, that Thaddeus Stevens, none of these guys can claim that level of political achievement, but Simon Cameron can. And so by dismissing Cameron as merely a guy who wouldn't steal a red hot stove, or maybe he would, we miss the important role he played in American politics and the ways in which we can understand the unique political environment of the 19th century through his experiences. I thank you very much. Uh, I stand open for questions. And let me just say, if I haven't convinced you to, part, uh, to spend $27 and part, uh, to part with $27 and buy this book, there is a sex scandal. Cameron does get involved in a sex scandal in his mid-70s. <laughs> Chapter 10 is well worth the $27. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Quite recently, the Brookings Institution has issued a uh, paper comparing the demise of the Whigs, splintering because of uh, Taylor's presidency and outsider, to our current situation with an outsider in the White House now. Mm -hmm. Have you read the article and do you have a view of it? I, do, I have not read it, and I'm always a little skeptical about commenting on something I haven't read, but I will speak to the general point, which is a comparison of our contemporary political environment to the political environment of uh, the first half of the 19th century. And what I would argue, and again, this is based on not having read the analysis, not having looked at the evidence, I am skeptical of those comparisons because there are a lot of institutional and social norms that have changed with regard to partisan political identity that have made the parties far more entrenched than they were in the 19th century. Um, and again, one of the things that I'm dealing with as I'm writing this narrative history of Grant's presidency is the transformation of the Republican Party um, during the late 1860s and the early 1870s into a much more recognizable policy, you know, platform-driven institution and much less of a, an institution driven by attachment to individuals. In the early part of the 19th century, what you had were cults of personality. Um, that might be too strong a term, but nowadays what we tend to have is attachment to platforms um, rather than individuals. And so we say, I don't particularly like the candidate my party has chosen, but he or she will enact policies based on this platform that I agree with. 
And that is a very different mental universe from the one in which Simon Cameron uh, existed in, at least early on. Thank you for the question. Others? Yes. A lot. Uh, Stanton, Stanton's a dirt bag. Let me just say, Edwin Stanton is a dirt bag. Uh, initially, I had thought I was going to write a bio of, of Stanton. And in fact, uh, UNC was in the process of publishing Lincoln's Autocrat. And there's actually another bio of Stanton that just that is coming out later this year. So Stanton's enjoying a bit of a renaissance. Stanton was a dirt bag. And I will tell you, so there's this famous story about bankers coming to the White House, right? And saying, oh, Simon Cameron's got to go because he's so corrupt. And we won't sell bonds if Simon Cameron doesn't go. You've all heard this story, right? And of course, Lincoln being you know, the angel of the hour says, oh, gentlemen, all you need to do is bring me one instance of corruption, and I will give you his head. And they, of course, go away because, you know, didn't find any corruption. And what everyone focuses on is that what a great guy Abraham Lincoln was, and not the fact that none of these guys had any evidence of corruption. But I want to point to something else, and that's the fact that these guys were all bankers from New York, right? They were all bond strip, well, I mean, come on, I'm from Philadelphia. But actually, this is relevant. They were, all, they were all bonds traders from New York. They were bond salesmen from New York. They were coming in order to defang the most prominent politician from Pennsylvania. This was part of a war between Pennsylvania and, Philadelphia, and, excuse me, Pennsylvania and New York for who was going to be the financial capital of the United States that went back at least to the construction of the Erie Canal. And in fact, in my book on the bank war, which is awesome, go buy it, um, which is the defining political event of Jackson's presidency, in large part, that, competi that competition between Pennsylvania and New York is in many ways what undergirds that position. And so it should come as no surprise, who do you think gins Jackson up to go after the bank? No, no, Cameron's from Pennsylvania. Second bank in the United States is headquartered in Philadelphia. Cameron's a banker. He may not love the bank, but he loves the fact that banks in Philadelphia Martin Van Buren, who in addition to being you know, short and having terrible hair, is also from New York. And he has a lot to do with pushing Jackson to go after the second bank in the United States. Not because Jack Van Buren is necessarily opposed to a second bank, but he's opposed to a second bank that's in Philadelphia. And so in many ways, that competition between New York and Pennsylvania you know, goes throughout the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And incidentally, Pennsylvania has the second highest number of electoral votes in this period and is a kingmaker. Who has the first? New York. So there's a lot of political subtext that's going into this. But you know who's working with these New York bankers? Stanton's brother. Stanton's brother is working behind the scenes to put the squeeze on the Lincoln administration by saying, we're not going to sell bonds, and by targeting Cameron. And you know, Stanton's talking out of both sides of his mouth. He's giving Cameron political opinions, but at the same time, he's talking about Cameron behind his back. And that's all laid out in the book. Other, that's a great question. Other questions? Yeah, when, when uh, 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 know-nothings, out here in the West, if you were a know-nothing, that was a death knell. I mean, you, in fact, that's why they would call them know-nothings. They'd ask you, and you would say, I know nothing. Mm -hmm. Did you go to that meeting last night? I know nothing. Do you like, uh, you know, whoever? So it must have been different in Pennsylvania, because out here, if you were actually pointed out as a know-nothing, you lost the election, you lost the mayoral race, et cetera, et cetera, because of the high number of Germans and Irish people coming in here who could vote. Was that different in Pennsylvania? Yes. So we do have a high, I mean, even today, we have a very large uh, immigrant population from places like Germany and Ireland that were, would have been targeted by the know-nothings. But we also had a large nativist population that was opposed to you know, those immigrants. And it fell along a lot of uh, you know, well-trod lines of rural versus urban, uh, middle of the state versus the eastern seaboard of the state. I mean, there are a lot of issues going on. But one of the things that I want to suggest is the know-nothings are, there's more to the know-nothings than just this issue of immigration. 
And in fact, what a lot of people like Cameron and like his political followers see the Know Nothings as is a vehicle for protecting Pennsylvania's state rights. That doesn't mean that they don't sign on to really odious anti-immigrant policies. They do. But as I've suggested, a lot of, at least in Pennsylvania, a lot of what the Know Nothings are talking about is not necessarily that. They are talking about it, but a lot of it is also about issues of slavery, issues about northern states' rights that they see being violated by the fugitive slave law, um, protectionism. You know, a lot of these sectional issues that are not necessarily tied to the issue of immigration. But I want to be crystal clear, I'm not defending the fact that Cameron signs on with the know-nothings because they do ask him about this and he does kind of give this half-assed answer like, yeah, yeah, we got to do something about that, but let's talk about protectionism. Yeah, go ahead. You said in 77 that he saw the handwriting on the wall, he retired. Yes. So what was his motivation for seeing presidents, senators, he's, he's got wealth, he's retired, so he's not going to run for office again. What was he trying to accomplish? Well, his, he uh, engineers the election of his son to the Senate, and his son serves in the Senate, and he's also protecting the interests of this political machine. You know, it's not as if, you know, he goes out to the golf course and retires. He travels actively, he takes an active role in politics, and I think he enjoys being, you know, sort of the sage of Donegal, which is how he's referred to, Donegal being his estate. You know, this is a man who had been at the center of American political life since at least 1845 when he becomes a senator. You know, it's kind of hard to give that up after 30 years. And in many ways, you know, by filling this role, he gets all the benefits of that, that attention, those opportunities for wealth. I mean, he's still a very aggressive and active investor in industries and those sorts of things. But at the same time, he doesn't have to deal with the downside of that. Does that make sense? OK. How about we do one more question, and then we sell some books? Yeah. When Lincoln issued the proclamation uh, on emancipation, yes. It really pisses him off. Oh, yes. He, uh, he writes a letter to Chase that's very sarcastic. And he says, well, huzzah, Lincoln's come to the point that the poor Secretary of War advocated in 1861. Thank God he found, I mean, it's, it, he, Cameron is still angry about his dismissal in 1863. And in many ways, Cameron is a pragmatist he recognizes that his political rehabilitation in many ways depends upon Lincoln and Lincoln's political success, but that doesn't mean that he necessarily forgives or forgets. And his correspondence, particularly with former members of the cabinet, is very, very indicative that it doesn't mollify him. It pisses him off more than anything else. At least if Lincoln was going to be wrong, he would still be wrong. But you fired me for saying something that now, 18 months later, you're doing? Like, hello. So it, it, it really, it, it, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not that Lincoln does that that brings Cameron around. It's that Cameron recognizes he needs Lincoln, and Lincoln needs him. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.